Welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming today. Today's topic is from conflict to community resolution strategies for board members and managers. Um, for today's program, we have about 650 people that have registered for the event from more than 42 states and a few people from outside of the United States. So we are very glad to have all of you join us today. Today's topic is a sensitive issue for some people, and we want to apologize in advance if we trigger a traumatic experience for anyone. If it does become a trigger for you, please feel free to log off the call. This will be recorded if you'd like to come back to it later. This topic is also extremely important to prepare us to handle potentially dangerous situations. Despite media attention, Truly dangerous occurrences do not happen every day. However, we wanna make sure that if you are ever in a dangerous situation, that you have the tools and resources to be prepared for that, for that problem. Um, we're gonna to start today's program with our panelists. We'll spend about the first 40 minutes focusing on scenarios and best practices to resolve conflict, as well as tools and resources to use in an active violence situation. During the session, we encourage you to share questions, comments, or resources in the chat. We will be recording the session, as I said, and we'll distribute that after, distribute the recording after the program, likely early next week, with this presentation, the PowerPoint presentation, as well as any additional resources and information from the chat. We'll do our best to answer those questions as we go along. If we are unable to answer them, we will provide uh, information following our program. After our initial part of the program, we will be dividing into breakout rooms based on geography to continue the conversation and come back together at the end for some closing thoughts. Before we start the program, I'd like to thank Front Steps for their sponsorship and encourage you to watch this short video. Hey everyone, my name is Matt DeWolf and I'm the CEO of Front Steps. And today we're incredibly proud to be supporting the great work that CAI does, especially the work that they do for our community association managers who are such a vital part of the success that we have as an industry. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Front Steps, we're an all-in-one cloud-based technology provider that provides everything that you need uh, to run your community association management company, all the way from the back office software through to the mobile apps and technology you put in front of your board members and homeowners, all the way down to the security that you do for your communities that you serve. And if we don't have something you need, we have a, a broad base of integrations with third-party providers so that you can get the technology that your company needs. So the next time you're thinking about making a technology investment in your company, please consider checking us out here at Front Steps. You can reach us through our website, which is frontsteps.com. That's enough about us. I really hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thanks for having us, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. So I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. We have Leslie Alvarez, CMCA AMS LSM PCAM, who's a regional director with Castle Group. Kara Cermak, CMCA AMS PCAM, who is Senior Vice President of Learning and Development with Real Manage. And Officer Robert Opset from the City of Alexandria, Police Department, and he has more than 15 years of special operations team or SWAT experience and eight years of tactical training and response unit experience. We're going to start off with Leslie and Kara to share some information with you. Please take it away. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kara Cermak, as you just heard. And uh, <laughs> Leslie and I hope to give you some information that will sort of prepare you in advance so that maybe you can avoid um, escalating behavior. Um, so let's start with why. Why does conflict even start in community association dynamics? There is some sociology behind this, sort of the caveman theory. This is where, this is their home. This is where they raise their families. This is their sanctuary. So it comes with big emotions. Um, right up front, before you even get into the room. And then you add all of these other things that are a possibility of uh, exacerbating uh, any disagreements whatsoever. Um, number one, there is a fear of rejection. That is, for me, that is the overriding problem 
for uh, many, you know, so board members sometimes will act in a certain way um, or homeowners or anybody act in a certain way because they want to make sure that they're heard. Um, and then sometimes it gets heated, like I say, because they're in, you're, you're talking about their home. You are telling them what they can do in their home. Yeah, Bless Kara, you. you know what I was going to say was, you know, we, we, it's our business, right? It's our job to do this every day. And so we come at it from a very logical standpoint, generally as professionals. And when emotions get involved, sometimes logic is out the window. <laughs> and like you said, then it becomes emotional. Yeah, 100%. Um, and like I say, you have the cards stacked against you a little bit because you're talking about their home. And the minute you are telling people what they can and can't do in their home, it's just inherent that there's going to be some conflict. We need to remember um, that as, you know, as leaders, whether you're board members or whether you are community managers, our presence and what we are, mod the behavior we're modeling very often is exactly what's going to take place in the room, right? So if we are, um, our tone of voice is such that it's welcoming, um, facial expressions, sometimes managers forget that we can see you and they roll their eyes. <laughs> you can't roll your Especially eyes. Especially on Zoom, right? Especially on Zoom, sometimes we forget that there's a camera sitting in front of us. Uh, absolutely. Which I recommend that when you are on, you know, any presentation or board meeting that you be able to see yourself because that's going to help, right? We have to remember that there are all of these situations um, that come with, uh, come with problems of their own. So whether someone has a mental illness, whether they are, have an alcohol issue, um, they are, they're just angry people, they, cultural differences, huge, we forget that these cultural differences make a big, make a big difference. We could be insulting someone and they, and we don't even know it. We wouldn't even realize it sometimes. Absolutely. You know, I just, I, I find Kara that, you know, people um, are so receptive to kindness and, you know, and, and just having empathy for them. And so being able to mirror that and reflect that, especially when they come to us in an, uh, you know, in an upset emotional state. Uh, is very helpful. So we'll talk about some of those things as we come along, like how to run a meeting. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about better tips to to make meetings be less adversarial because sometimes that happens as well. So let's talk about the cultural differences. Um, can we go to the next slide? Why do we want to partner with people of other you know difference differences of culture, Kara? What are, what are we you know really looking for when when we're doing that? What's the best benefit for that? Right. So the very best community association boards are those that don't immediately agree with one another, that have different life experiences, they have different skill sets. So, the, you know, the setup of community association boards is really a great thing, but it comes with the possibility that we might insult one another unintentionally very often but you're going to get the very best decisions for your community if in fact you have people that come from different walks of life. There's, I mean, I, I, I give presentations for my company all the time. I research what are the best high performing teams. And what I'm telling you is that this is one inherent thing in uh, having the most high performing teams. Right. Kara, you know, one of the things that's on the slide here I love is the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. I always say I'm going to play devil's advocate. I want to see both sides of the coin, right? I might have my own perspective and my own opinion based on my life experiences, but being able to flip that side of the coin and being able to look and see what the alternative opinion is, I may still not agree with them. I may still vote the way I was, you know, I may still stand behind my recommendation the way that I originally proposed it, but at least then the other person feels the connection and sees that you actually did try to understand their perspective, because that's really what we're all looking for in life, right? We're looking for understanding. We want other people to understand where we're coming from and why we do the things we do. Right. And so there's a couple of little tricks here. So maybe you have um, your community associations board and or homeowners that you can just feel that underlying potential for things to go awry. 
So let's say you have the same person that is always saying devil's advocate and they start getting adversarial and you feel that coming, right? What if the board agreed that you would appoint a new devil's advocate at each meeting? Then people have to step outside of their box and that person has to let someone else be the devil's advocate. Um, there's also, you know, I like that. That's the, that's a really cool and unique way to look at it. You know, yeah. um, you know, again, like you said, if one person is always playing that, then that be person can become, whether they intend to be confrontational or not, can begin to portray or lead appear that way. But by creating an opportunity for other people to make to provide that same you know skill and that 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 perspective at each meeting it gives the opportunity to, to rotate it right rotate the, the 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 dartboard so to speak right exactly and one another trick tip um if you know you have a complex problem that you know is going to press some buttons and we know right we know um most of the time not all the time um, but what if you, you know, you know, you have a couple of board members that are a little more shy, that are a little more reticent to speak up, especially if you have a bunch of type A personalities in yeah. on your board. What if everybody wrote down, here are my thoughts about this complex problem, and then the manager shares, hey, we have these ideas happening, because when we have a problem that people are feeling shy or feeling attacked and they don't speak up, we're not getting the best end result. We're not getting the best information. So I find that's a kind of a great way to make sure everyone is heard. Yeah. Additionally, people need to have a safe space to, to speak. I find that very often familiarity amongst one another changes the conversation. So, you know, when I would come into a meeting early, I would talk about, hey, my daughter's in a dance competition tonight. Um, or, oh my God, you can't believe what happened to me today. That creates a, a space where- Commonality, like, right? Absolutely. Right. A sense of you have something in common with each other. And we're all human. You know, we're sharing our experiences as humans. And I realize, you know, people are, mm, you know, is that touchy feely? No, the reality is, is that's how you, that's how you create high performing teams. And it's statistically true as well. It's not just anecdotal. It's definitely how you build a connection with someone for sure. I like to do board orientations with new board members and go over the roles and responsibilities as a board member and also then talk about the dialogue of how they partner and work with each other, right? And who's taking point on what and how to partner best with your property or your community manager and, and your management team as a general, your management company, whatever your organization has, whether it's a self-managed or a management firm, how you can best partner with that community management team. And, you know, that in itself, I, I really think is a great way of helping people to find that commonality and, and, and realize where each other's coming from, right? You can share in a more open, informal setting prior to the disc, you know, the, the tough conversations yes. that happen during a board Set meeting. yourself up for success. Um, we're ready for the next slide because yes. This is going that so goes fast. right into it. Absolutely. You know, like, wow. um, okay, so I, you know, nobody paid me to say this, but CAI is an amazing resource, you guys. They have so many things that will help us. Um, they will help us with codes of conduct. There's this civility pledge. How do we, how do we, you know, get through a situation where we're having trouble with one another? We can point not only research it ourselves, but point everyone else to, hey, I read this and I think this might help us. And like Leslie said, start from the beginning before you have conflict. Yeah. I mean, CAI has the, obviously, the civility pledge. They have a code of conduct um, and ethics on, on there as well that your board of directors can adopt. Um, but, you know, they even have, um, you know, the gap reports that are talking about the role and responsibility of each one of the officers, the, the, the president, the secretary, the treasurer, what do minutes truly, what are minutes really supposed to look like, right? Like sometimes your boards are disputing and arguing over what's supposed to go in the minutes for, for, for longer than, yes. than you would, would really think. But training them, an educated board member is the best ally to avoiding conflict. Absolutely. 
Yeah. All right, next slide, please. So as we've been talking about what, let's start from the beginning. Let's set things up so that when we get to a right, problem okay. situation, are we good? Somebody uh, just unmuted, yeah. Okay. No, okay. When we get to a problem situation, then we can, we'll deal with it as a team. So we wanna remember to present information factually. We wanna include everything that we can possibly think of that will educate them about this situation. And we always need to, as managers, provide a recommendation. Ask board members to contact you with questions in advance of the meeting. Sometimes you can get rid of adversarial problems right by doing that from the beginning. You know, Kara, that is a, a, a problem sometimes, or there's that one board member sometimes that likes to come um, and have an aha or gotcha, gotcha. on the prop, uh, on manager, right? They really want to, you know, catch them not knowing something. And when that happens, it it sets the community manager off, right? Like in a defensive mode. And from that point forward, they're coming from a defensive stature that is it difficult to remain neutral and be the de-escalator, right? It's just, right. it's more, it's more challenging for them to backpedal and, and backtrack if they don't, if they get caught in something like that. So definitely, I think getting the, your, your information to your boards, in advance of the meeting with a request that they bring those questions before. If you're able to do workshops as opposed to bringing topics just straight to the board meeting, those sorts of you know best practices that are out there can definitely make your board meetings run so much more efficiently, so much more smoothly. And the reality of it is, is when your community sees your board working cohesively all together as one team, it builds the sense of community that is what we're all here to do. Uh, and, and it just it just provides such a better atmosphere for your meeting. Your meetings almost become pleasurable. <laughs> right, right. All right, next slide, please. One big thing, facilitating. So if you're if you're the board president and you're just not comfortable with facilitating, but you're great with a ton of other things being president, that's okay. Let's have the manager help be the facilitator. We need to impose time limits. And when we impose time limits from the beginning before we have a problem, when we get to a problem, everybody knows the rules, right? Everybody knows that this is how it's going to go. As the facilitator, you want to make sure that all the major points have been said. So you want to, you know, many of my board presidents or myself write down, here's all the points that have been said so far. And guess what? There's about five more that we need to consider. Um, bring the conversation back on track. I know, Leslie, you have a ton of experience with this just as well as I do, especially in large scale communities. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you said, the time limits. I think that, you know, you can get someone that can take over on a, a half an hour of back and forth. Being respectful, giving those residents or board members uh, maybe three minutes for their comments on the topic and having it listed on the agenda, like you said, in advance that this is going to be your limit. Um, having an outside timekeeper who helps manage that for you, not necessarily the manager, but somebody else, maybe even somebody that gets appointed from the audience. That's the yeah. timekeeper to help deneutralize that. Right. And then not engaging with back and forth. Give that person their full three minutes or two minutes or whatever the allotment is to speak. Because what I see sometimes is when a, when a resident, let's just use a resident as an example, or even a board member, when they're speaking in their three minute limit and, and, and they maybe ask a question and somebody on the board or management starts to respond back to them, then you're eating into their three minutes and you're kind of cutting them off. Let them have their peace. Let them say what they want to say so that they can feel heard. And then if appropriate, you can respond to it. Right, absolutely. All right, next sign, next slide. I said sign because guess what? We're going to talk about what the signs are that conflict is building. You know, most of the time you can feel it. It's a feeling, hostility, tension, people getting competitive, bringing personalities into things. We need to re call it out. Hey, I feel like we're headed in a, in a bad direction on this particular topic. Do we need to take a few minutes? Um, is there some question I can answer so that you feel more comfortable talking about this? We have to say, say it, say what you can feel out loud. 
Yeah, there's elephants in the room and, and just addressing them head on is definitely a better way to avoid it than, than leaving these things lingering out there in the background. It only creates uh, more drama in the end. And by the way, if this is consistently happening, maybe you ask the board, could we have about 15 minutes so we can talk about ways that we can um, learn from one another and make some great decisions without hostility like what is what's the undercurrent that's happening right now again say it out loud it's definitely the best way to do it all right next slide why don't they step in and help me there is psychology behind this um people are waiting for that other person to step in you know well I don't want to step in I don't want to be the one being attacked I want someone else to do it I find very often that is either a very experienced board member or the manager needs to step in. We can't just allow people to be um, diminished and treated terribly in front of us. It's something that we have to do. And what happens is that, again, we fear consequences, but that's really, that's the expert's uh, position and job. Yeah, Kara, you know, I, I, when I see this slide, I think also, um, as you mentioned, you know, sometimes it's amongst themselves, but that attack can also come against the manager for one reason or another. Not saying that there aren't, you know, people that, that you know, managers that, that don't make mistakes and such, but the personal attack and the, you know, lack of professionalism um, towards the manager can sometimes, it can, can come across very, very tough for that manager. And so when you, as having seen that when your when your board members or residents are you know upset with something that that management is implementing or management is done, um, then you know you see maybe other board members or other residents who just kind of watch like it's a like it's more of a spectacle than like you said stepping in to help intercede and stop it from behaving. And like you said, that's just you know human nature, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, you know it. I think it does help if you have some sort of a thought that something is going to happen and that there may be, you know, that verbal altercation that happens sometimes in, in a meeting or due to an issue in the office. If you have another teammate or maybe your, your, your um, superior, if you're with a management company, your regional director, your vice president or somebody else that's present at the meeting, or maybe another board member that you can speak to in advance and say, I'm concerned that this might happen you know, can you please help to rein this back in if it does? It, they might be more, they would be more comfortable coming forward to help intervene and calm this, calm the waters down if they're prepared for it. But sometimes it's just, it happens so fast and people don't know how to re respond or react. And, and I think that's something to, to, be, to keep in mind. Exactly. So, Here's what's going to happen right now. We're going to have some slides that are going to help you outside of this presentation. The next slide, for instance, is about humility. Humility can change so much. Confidence, but humble. So you, there's some links in here for you. The next slide talks about modeling the behavior you expect and killing them with kindness. I promise that this works when you are authentically being kind to someone, um, there's a few people that it won't work with, but by and large, this works. And then finally, what we're gonna talk about here very quickly, first of all, we have uh, two slides on de-escalation. So I'm gonna ask you to go to the next one, please. Um, you wanna remember not to, first of all, try not to inter internalize it. Try not to take it personally. Active listening. So the whole time Leslie is talking, I'm doing this because I'm listening to her, saying it back to someone, letting them vent like Leslie just said. Leslie, I know that, um, you know, you probably have a couple of examples about de-escalating. And as we close out, do you maybe want to uh, give us an example? <laughs> yeah, you know, in this business, any of us that have been in the business for any length of time, we've certainly encountered our fair share of, of issues and, and tough conversations, you know. Um, I will tell you, you know, I've had 
you know, talking about the boards, you know, again, I just think it's really important when we're in a board meeting or when we are in a office setting that, you know, we understand that people are going to come at us emotionally. They're going to be upset. We have to respond in a, in a good manner, um, like you said, mirroring them, listening to them and such. And generally speaking, those situations, while they may unnerve us, maybe even upset us emotionally because we felt attacked or, or something of that nature, there isn't, there isn't a, a physical threat right? It's, it's still just something that, you know, is that we can brush off our shoulders for the most part and chalk it up to another day on the job. Um, and if you're feeling that way, regardless of whether you're a board member or what, you know what, could we take a few minutes? I need to use the restroom. Yeah. Take a it. breather. Absolutely. A breather. Managing the mental, managing your mental health and making sure that you take care of yourself is absolutely important. And I think that when those situations do start to happen, um, you you know you you have your teammates, have your partners, um, all aware of you know sometimes it's it's I need to take a step away. I I've got to take that moment, that breather, um, because again, there's a difference between somebody that's coming at you verbally and you know it's emotionally driven than you know what our next um, panelist is going to speak about, which is obviously a more isolated, hostile situation that um, that that can happen, and we can all kind of you know we'll learn from him about those those things. But right. yeah, I, I segue. Yeah, I think that, you know, again, these board members and, and, and meetings and residents and all the engagements and even even with service providers, sometimes the way that we work with our business partners, yep. you know, everybody's got supply chain issues and we're also, you know, tense and, and, and hurry up and get it done now that it definitely is a great opportunity to learn again, to mirror people, to really pay attention, to look forward to them and, um, you know, practice empathy. All right, so we're going to turn this over now to, um, and I'm sure, Crystal, you're going to introduce uh, the officer, and thank you for having us. We're going to be quiet now. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kara and Leslie. That was amazing. Um, I'd like to introduce Officer Bobby Opset, who is with the City of Alexandria, to share with us some information about active violence training. Please take it away. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Crystal, for having me on. Again, my name is uh, Bobby Opposite. I'm with the Alexandria Police Department. Uh, I like to applaud Leslie and Kara. This great uh, speech on de-escalation. A lot of things that they were speaking to is how we kind of train officers to de-escalate situations. Um, but the reason I'm on today is we're going to talk about active violent incident, um, better known as probably active shooter for most. Um, this program is really kind of designed or backed by DHS, Department of Homeland Security. Um, for this block, it's hopefully going to be a refresher. If not, it's passing along some information to give you guys a response in case you have a critical incident that happens at one of your properties. You go to the next slide. One of the first things we need to talk about when we talk about this, and again, I like to reiterate what <clears throat> Crystal says, this is not an everyday occurrence. Um, we have to be very mindful that when we talk about these things, emotions are high, people are scared, but there is risk we take every day in our lives. Um, one of the risks we have to prepare for, unfortunately, are, are uh, violent incidents that may occur, but they don't occur every day. There's no expectation that during your typical day at work, you're going to have to address this, but uh, think of it like a fire drill. We train for fire drills all the way from elementary school up just in case something happens that the f building catches on fire that we have the appropriate response in order to react appropriately. This is very similar training in that we have to understand what our thought process should be if we need to save ourselves or someone else from a bad situation. So what I like to do as always is we need to understand what situation we're dealing with. So this definition we're using here is from the TAC, uh, National Tactics Officers Association. An active shooter is one or more subject to participate in a random or systematic shooting spree, demonstrate their intent to continuously harm others. An active shooter's overriding objective appear that of mass murder, rather criminal conduct, such as robbery or kidnapping. So again, we have to understand what it is. 
it's not the bank robbery that went wrong. So a bank robbery goes wrong. What that is, is someone goes into the bank, they try to take the money, or they give the teller a note to receive the money. They don't give the, the suspect the money and the suspect gets angry and he shoots a teller or he hurts someone else in the bank. That's bank robbery with homicide attached to it. That is not an act of violent incident. When we talk about act of violent incidents, we talk about someone who has no criminal intent. Their only intent is to harm others and to continuously harm others until there's some kind of intervention. Why do we call it act of violent incident now rather than active shooter? So when this um, situation occurred, it started in 1999 with Columbine. Columbine was an incident where two kids went to a high school in Colorado. They began shooting into the school. There was really no intent. Officers back then didn't have the response we have now. People didn't have the understanding of how they should react to a, uh, an event like this. So we called it an active shooter. Through the years, what we've learned is if we call something active shooter, shooting has to be implied or has to happen for people to respond a certain way. So when we call it active violence, any act of violence, whether it's a shooting, whether it's somebody with a baseball bat, whether it's something with a knife, uh, which we just saw recently, I believe in Vegas, our response should be the same. Um, and in this context, the response we're gonna go with is a run, hide, fight program. Um, would you like to go to the next slide? So again, run, hide, fight, it's simplistic in nature. And that's what we really try to push is we don't wanna overcomplicate things. We wanna keep things very simple. So again, like I said, it was created or it's backed by the Department of Homeland Security. There are other models available out there. Um, there's a company called Alice who has a program that is extremely similar. They just use different terminology. Um, understanding what your response is based on where you are in the incident is extremely important. Keeping things simple. Don't overthink things. When we start to overthink things, we freeze, we stop. We don't make good decisions. And then we always have to remember, Every decision we take, every decision we make has inherent risk. So if I decide to run, there is a risk in running. If I decide to hide and stay in place, there is a risk there. And then obviously when we talk about fighting, fighting is the last resort we'll speak to, but there's obviously inherent risk if I'm gonna take on somebody who has the advantage over me based on a weapon. When we also talk about run, hide, fight, run, hide, fight is not, I have to run and then I have to hide and then I have to fight. We have to make decisions based on where we are and the, the information we're provided. So there may be a situation where I have to go straight to fighting or I'm going to hide until, until a shooter or that person is past my location. And then maybe I have the ability to run or possibly if it's, it's, if it happens and I'm far enough away, my first option is to run. So remember, it doesn't have to be in order in run, hide, fight. Ma'am, can you go to the next slide? So when we talk about running, obviously if we have an incident that occurs in our location or around us, the first thing we wanna do is get as far away as possible. Um, we want to stay flexible. So we don't want to lock ourselves into, this is the only way I can get out. So we may have an idea, like if something happens here, this is how I'm going to get out. But what happens if plan A, the shooter or that assailant is in your way of plan A? You have to know where plan B is. Or I may be taking plan A and now something changes. I have to re-divert and go somewhere else or change, or I may have to start to hide or fight. When I run, I want to leave everything behind. I don't need my purse. You don't need your backpack. You don't need your briefcase. At best, maybe you take your phone, but if your phone is across the room, leave your phone. In this scenario, seconds count. 
So the time it takes you to get across the room to get your phone and run out the door could cause you those seconds that are invaluable. So remember, leave everything behind. You don't need it. We'll get it later. And when we run, we want to keep our hands visible. As you run out under these stressful conditions, police officers are responding in. I like to remind people, we are human. We have the same insecurities, fears, things that you're having, but we're running towards a gunfire. Or we're running towards that person with a knife. So make it easy on us. Keep your hands visible. Allow us to make quick, easy decisions and escort you the way we came. So if we are running down a hallway towards an incident, you can assure yourself or a good bet is that the area we just came from is a safe place for you to run to exit the building. Helping others. Helping others is a hard one. So people we have people have different reactions under stress. Under stress, people can react. They can think, they can think clearly. Some people can follow directions, and that's all they can is follow directions. They can't make decisions. Some people can't do either. They 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 shut down, they won't react, and they kind of turn, uh, they make themselves not move. So as someone who's leaving an area, who you've decided it's the best place to do is leave, you're going to make those hard decisions whether I can stay and help and I can try to coax somebody with me or whether I have to leave them behind and run out myself, okay? The other thing I want everyone to think about as we go through this, when it talks about running, we always think about you're sitting in an office right now. Um, you have a window in your office. Is a door the only way out of your office? Is it the only way out of the space? Because it's not. When you think about running, there's other ways to get out of a room. If I can't go through the door because I'm afraid that the shooter or the assailant's outside my room, I can go out a window. I'll pose another question to you. If you're on the second or third floor, do you still have the ability to run if you can't go through your door? I would say yes. Sometimes we make decisions are, are bad and worse. And sometimes we have to choose a bad decision over a worse decision. So falling, hanging from a windowsill and dropping to the ground from a second story window is a bad decision. But it's a better decision than staying in my office where someone with a gun could come in and do me harm. So remember, as we evaluate our environment around us, we need to look at other options we may have in order to get out of the bad situations. Again, a broken leg will be better than a, a wound by a knife or a bullet. The last thing on this slide you'll notice, um, it's kind of a mundane task, but when we have an event like this and people begin to run, um, it's really important for supervisors, managers to have an account of who's on the property. Because as we go through the building, as the police start to respond and the incident changes over into um, a search rather than, than seeking out the person who did this crime, um, we're going to start asking about who is, on the, who is at the building. So we need to know who is on leave, who called out sick, um, who's unaccounted for, who was able to call in. You need to have a working knowledge every day of who you have at your building um, because those are going to be the, the tedious things on the back end to reunite um, everybody who was at the site during the incident. Thank you. The next slide we'll talk about is hide. So remember when we hide, um, what we're trying to do is, is not let the sale and the suspect have an easy target. So ideally when people come in, unfortunately to hurt people, they're looking for easy targets. They're looking for someone who they can injure or kill and then move on to the next. So if we're close to where we believe the situation occurring because the sound is loud, I start to smell burnt gunpowder, um, I hear screaming that is extremely close to my location. Um, what we need to do is think about hiding and thinking about staying in place, sheltering in place. So what we want to do is you can see we want to stay in outside the shooter's view. That could be under your desk. That could be in a closet. That could be behind a bookshelf. Um, 
those are places where I'm hiding behind the suspect. Understand that there is a very big difference between cover and concealment. All we're talking about right now, a hollow core door, a desk, that's just concealment. That is something that's gonna hide your view from someone who wants to hurt you that's not gonna protect you. Um, if we want to get better, right? We want to look for cover, which is going to be things that are going to stop bullets. So concrete walls, brick walls, uh, metal doors, all those things are going to defend us from bullets, okay? We want to barricade our entry points. So lock, first we can lock doors, we have the ability, but then we want to talk about barricading doors. When we barricade doors, there's a right way and, and not so good way to barricade doors. When I barricade a door, I wanna close the door. And then instead of just piling things in front of that door, and this is better demonstrated rather than talking through, but I hope people will follow along. Instead of just pu putting things against the door and making just a weighted door, because all we're doing is adding weight to the door. What we wanna do is make a strong wall. So if we can create a structure that touches the door and then touches the back wall, the opposite wall of that door, what happens is we've made a strong point from the door to the back wall. In order to open that door, somebody would have to push that door all the way through to the opposite wall. Um, and as I speak of this, I'm speaking about inward opening doors. Um, that's a much stronger barricade rather than just taking chairs and desks and putting them in front of the door. So um, hopefully we can understand that, but we're trying to create a strong, uh, a solid structure from the door to the back wall. If we're talking about an outward opening door, so a door that opens into the hallway, that's gonna be a door that you have to tie off. So when we tie a door off, we're gonna have to put a knot on the doorknob and then we're gonna have to tie the other end of that rope or extension cord or computer cord to something else that's structured in the room that won't fail. So something that's, that won't give. Once we do that, obviously some of the things that kind of come, uh, come apparent is we want to silence our cell phones. Turn it off, you don't need it. Don't just put it on vibrate, stop, turn it off. It's no longer needed. If someone is that close to do you harm, the last thing you want to do is have someone make a phone call to even let vibration. So again, turn them off, leave them alone. We'll make phone calls later. Turn off your lights. Everybody's walked through a hallway and they see a closed door with a little bit of light coming out from underneath the jam. What happens if you keep the lights on, now you pass in front of the door, you've now backlit yourself. It tells anyone in, outside in the hallway that there's somebody in the room. So by turning the lights off, we get rid of all the lighting problems. So that means closing blinds, making sure there's no sunlight coming through, places where we don't uh, want light in. That's what we want to do is make sure all those lights are out so they don't have an idea where we are. Again, we want them to bypass us and go looking for people rather than coming and trying to address us. All right, where might we not want to hide? So we've kind of gone through this um, by the other bullet points. We don't wanna hide in open areas. So we don't wanna hide behind something that's smaller than ourselves. Um, we don't wanna, we try to wanna find places to hide that's gonna protect us from weapons, all right? And then as we hide and as we create, what I want you to do is we wanna start formulating plans because unfortunately the next topic we're gonna to talk about is fighting. So if I'm hiding, as I'm hiding, I need to start to generate a plan or, or put a plan in motion that if someone does come into my room, how I'm going to address that. It could be by myself. It could be with multiple people. But what we need to do is create a plan of attack. <clears throat> Fighting will always be our last resort, okay? I will never advocate, no officer will ever advocate that, that anyone start with fight if they don't have to. It should always be our last resort, but we unfortunately always have to be prepared. <clears throat> what we want to look for is we, A, want to have a team leader 
in that room. If it's by yourself, it's your plan. But if we're with multiple people, we need to create one person who's going to try to give decisions or make a plan. Because what happens if we have 10 people and 10 plans, it's not going to work. So we need one plan about the group. First thing we're going to do is we're going to find improvised weapons. Um, what I can tell you is everything's an improvised weapon. A book, scissors, pens, a chair, whatever you have at your disposal turns into an improvised weapon. Okay. At that, now we become aggressive. The fight part of this is purely about aggression. If you don't act with aggression, unfortunately, things are going to go bad. So we need to act. Whatever it takes, whatever makes you upset. And aggression is not a bad word. Aggression used in the appropriate context is a great thing that we need to uh, utilize when having to go up against someone who has the advantage. So when we act with aggression, we want to use a swarm tactic. So if I have multiple people, what I want to do is use those improvised weapons. I want to throw and disorient the person entering the room or in that open area as much as possible. People can't do two things at once. People can't defend themselves from a book getting thrown at their head and also target an innocent person. So what we'd like to do is we want to try to disrupt their OODA loop. We want to disrupt their decision-making process because once we disrupt their uh, decision-making process, it gives us the advantage to react and to become the aggression. So what we like to see is as half that group is throwing something at that person's head, the other half of that group is trying to swarm and take that person to the ground and disarm them from whatever weapon they have. Okay. Um, when we take them to the ground, obviously we want to get that weapon away from them. But we also want to use leverage in order to get them as spread out as possible. So if you have one person on one arm, one person on the other arm, we put one person on one leg, one person on the other leg, we have someone controlling the head, the group of us have leverage over top that assailant. As a group, we're a much better fighting force. If you're by yourself, this turns into follow your shot. And I know that's difficult, but what we would do is we'd have to use that improvised weapon to disrupt their decision-making process. And then as that disruption is occurring, we are going to be the swarm. We are going to have to go and fight that individual uh, person on person. And again, it's only with aggression does that become a winnable fight. Um, oh, just one more, go back just one more, just, just to stay with the fight topic. And this is what, this is the part that's really uneasy to talk about, but I need everyone to have expectations. I call it the John Wick effect. When we talk about fighting, especially with someone using a firearm and we do have to fight, we have to have an expectation that somebody is going to get injured. There is going to be an injury more than likely, hopefully not, but we need to be prepared for it. So the John Wick effect. Unfortunately, what media, what the movies, what other mediums have done to us is they've made us so that if someone gets injured or someone gets shot, they're immediately going to die. That is not, that is not a fact. Um, people do get injured, do get shot. It doesn't touch anything vital and people survive that wound. What I'm trying to pose here is that your mental, your mental status, the mental part of this where, okay, somebody's injured or I'm injured, keeping that idea that I'm not going to die, that I'm going to live, I'm going to get to a doctor, they're going to fix me, is extremely important in survivability. So understanding that if you're the one injured, that it's, it may not be a, a, a injury that is going to be life-threatening, um, and then if you're the person helping or treating, the idea here is that we need to keep the person who's injured in the fight, understanding that they are going to be okay and that we are going to get them to proper care so they survive this encounter. All right, next slide. Um, I added this slide here at the end for DHS. So really what this is, is just a quick 
reminder of things to do. There are a lot of resources uh, for this application or for this training. Um, a lot of it is based around run, hide, fight in its simplicity. Um, if there's any questions, I know we're going to talk about them in the breakout room. If you have questions, I'm more than willing to answer any of them that may come up. Uh, this was a very short presentation. I hope everyone understands that there, there is more to this class uh, or more of this presentation. Please reach out to your local law enforcement. Um, hopefully, they'll be able to, to give you some more direction and some, some larger classes on this topic. Bobby, thank you. I, that was so valuable for our attendees. And I know from the chat, people are just looking for more. So we appreciate you sharing the resources for DHS and um, encouraging people to reach out to their local police departments. This is certainly a topic we wish we didn't have to talk about, but um, due to some, some instances we've had in the past, we, we feel like this information is required for many of our managers and board members. So we're going to deploy breakout rooms now. Before we conclude today, I would like to ask Leslie Kara and Officer Apsa to provide some final thoughts. Leslie, would you like to go first? Absolutely. Thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah, this is definitely um, from the most simple conflicts um, to the more um, life-threatening conflicts, an important training for all of us. We never know what we can come across in a daily basis. And we just want to make sure that everyone, um, you know, arrives home back to your family safely, both mentally and physically. Uh, so we want to give you all the tools. Um, mental health is one of my, um, you know, main um, pra uh, preaching right now that I've been talking about. Um, you know, it doesn't happen often, the active violence at all, but it does help to know that you're equipped and that you have the right tools. So we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Kara. Kara, you're on mute. There you I go. Am. I'm sorry, I'm back. Um, so, you know, just to wrap it up, I just want to say that this is not easy. This is not easy stuff when you're dealing with people's homes and heightened emotions, but it is possible. So we just need to use all of the resources we have available to us, create familiarity in your group, give a safe space for people to provide their opinions and thoughts and be methodical about it. If people are getting out of hand, be methodical. This is how we're going to do this. Um, thank you for volunteering your time. If you're a board member, we all thank you. And thank you managers for being here. I, I'm honored to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. And Officer Opset, would you close us out? Yes, ma'am. Um, with my part, I just want to reiterate, this is not an everyday occurrence. This is something that we prepare for, that we have to have a thought process about, but it's not something that we necessarily change our lives for or we dwell on all that often. Um, just have a plan in place, have an idea of what you're going to do. And then as a last thought, it's not just for where you work, where you live. You could be at a shopping mall. You could be at the food store. You could be anywhere in your uh, in your life, and this situation hopefully will never occur. But if it does, you have an idea of what what you should uh, should do. But again, please, again, it's not happening every day. Um, this is more preparation, just uh, to to make the similarity to a fire drill. Right? We don't go to work expecting our building to catch on fire. There should be no expectation that you should be that you will be involved in any kind of act of violence. Um, anytime. Thank you so much for that reminder. I love the fire drill analogy. It's, it's definitely um, it's easy to relate to that analogy. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our panelists and our room facilitators for today. Again, we hope you enjoyed the program. We do have these quarterly. We have a save the date up on the screen for 2023. CAI staff will follow up with all the registered attendees with the recording, the PowerPoint presentation, and some additional resources that will be early next week. Thank you again for attending and have an excellent afternoon. Bye, everybody.